Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the investment implications of COVID-19. I hope you're all well and managing to stay sane and safe out there in either lockdown or isolation, depending on whether you're in Australia or New Zealand. Um, it's really great to see that both of our countries are managing to do such a terrific job of containing the spread. Um, now, this is the last in this series of these webinars. It's the fourth of the series and the final ones. But a couple of things before I get on to today's agenda. Uh, we will have another webinar if you haven't had enough. Um, there is another invitation coming to you tomorrow. This time it'll be from our global colleagues. Um, so the webinar will be held next Wednesday, the 29th of April at 5 p.m. Australia time or 7 o'clock New Zealand time. Um, and it's going to cover or try to answer the question, has active management delivered in a time of crisis? And on that webinar will be uh, an extensive panel of Mercer's global leaders from equities to fixed income, private markets, alternatives and strategy. So um, please look out for that invitation and we'd love to see you registering for that one. A couple of other things. On Monday, you will receive uh, Mercer's client newsletter and in that will be replays to all of the webinars as part of this local series. Uh, and then we'd love to get some feedback from you. Have you enjoyed the webinars? Do you, do you appreciate this as a form of communication? Um, certainly open to having you know, this, this type of communication as part of our broader, um, uh, uh, you know, way, ways that we do communicate with you. So look out for a survey request. It'll be coming to you probably about the middle of next week and just let us know um, what you think. We'd really love to hear, hear that. Um, now, in terms of today, we've got a really great panel and a really great set of topics to cover today. So firstly, we're going to hear from Ya Ying Dong, who's our market strategist, and Ya Ying's going to really go through the macro update, uh, what's going on out there and what have been the developments uh, in the markets and both in terms of the, the virus and, and uh, the market reaction as well. Then we're going to take a little bit of a step back um, and be cognizant of the fact that most people on this call, I think, would be long-term investors. And so we want to have a little bit of a look at that longer term piece. So Dr. Harry Liam has joined us today. Harry's our Director of Strategic Research and Head of Capital Markets for the Pacific. And Harry's really gonna cover off um, those, those longer term considerations. So how is this COVID crisis feeding into our investment research and strategic research, but also how are we thinking about it from a capital markets assumptions perspective? And then finally, we've got Helga Bergden, our Global Business Leader for Responsible Investment, and she's going to take a look at uh, COVID-19 through a responsible investment lens. Now, just a reminder, you can uh, enter questions at any time during the webinar using the Q&A button, and we will come back to these uh, at the end of the webinar and make sure that we get all of your questions answered. So with that, Yao Ying, I'm going to hand over to you to go through the macro update. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Kylie, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank you for taking the time and to dial into our webinar. So in terms of the section that I wanted to talk about today, it's really uh, centered on three points, which is one looking at uh, the inter intersection between uh, the pandemic and also uh, macroeconomic outcomes. I'd like to mention also some developments across in the oil markets. And then lastly, to think about what this will mean from a dynamic uh, asset allocation perspective. And so kicking off with the first point, I think uh, for the audience members here, that uh, if we look at the first uh, two sets of charts on the left-hand side, that across both uh, Australia and New Zealand, we are seeing a very positive rate uh, of, of, of containment. And so the rate of new infection uh, in both countries have, have declined uh, considerably. And of course, now uh, both governments are also talking up uh, the possibility that, uh, that we can return to some uh, sense of normality uh, over the coming weeks. But the challenges for this pandemic are definitely not over. And in fact, I would say there are further challenges uh, to this journey. Now, one of the key factors that uh, wasn't uh, captured before, but we're starting to see 
developments now is the extent to which uh, this virus is now migrating from the developed into the emerging world. And so in particular, in countries such as India, which you'll see on the right hand side, and also in Indonesia as well, that new cases have actually started to increase at a fairly rapid pace. And to a large extent, I think, as long as there are hotspots or vast increases in new infections, no one is really safe um, from this. And so in relation to how the emerging world is likely to face challenges here, a combination of uh, weaker health systems, you know, the lack of interdepartmental coordination, and also just the absence of um, you know, institutions like the CDC will mean that it's going to be much more difficult uh, for, 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 for containment. And so really, uh, you know, resources being devoted across to help uh, suppress new cases uh, from institutions like WHO and of course individual governments become quite an important uh, endeavor uh, as we bring uh, the global rate of infections under control. Now, talking about initiatives to return back to work, I think it's also becoming quite clear that this is not going to be a smooth road. Now, a case in point is looking at you know, what's happened in Singapore, where arguably you know, a very strong initial period of containment uh, was, uh, was seen. However, the relaxation of rules uh, too quickly has actually resulted in quite a sharp increase in, in subsequent cases. And so even if we do look at um, places such as in China, where there has been a lot more uh, containment measures and also the better ability to track, there nevertheless has also been pockets of reinfections as well. And so what we think now is definitely that a return to work is likely to be quite slow. And of course, that's going to be marked by periods where there could be uh, some isolated cases of, of reinfection. But of course, the system is going to be much uh, better suited to respond to, to these developments. So in terms of then looking at the next slide, which shows, I guess, the broad interaction between the need to flatten two curves here. I mean, we focus on the first curve, which is about trying to save lives. And that's very, and that's very important. And I think on a global level, we, we are making quite a lot of progress in this endeavor. But the second curve, uh, you know, which is like an economic um, growth curve is just as important because it's about preserving livelihoods. Now, in this case here, what we can see is that the initial round of stimulus measures from central banks and from governments have been quite strong. And that's certainly going to suppress the, the extent of the economic damage that we're going to face. But we're still relatively early uh, in terms of going through this journey. And this is also going to highlight a very difficult balance that policymakers and governments have to weigh up, which is that in, act in actual fact, if we can suppress that economic curve or the recession curve even further, that actually goes, goes hand in hand with returning or reopening at a faster rate. And so we see that this is the case because the economic system is, is, is constantly adapting to shocks. And so whilst we, we have seen an initial shock um, play through in, in the system, there are often subsequent feedback mechanisms. And to a large extent, some of these impacts magnify the impact of these initial shocks. And so whilst it's important to ensure you know, the, the ability for the health system to respond to this, it's also going to be quite important to ensure that there's not going to be a severe loss of output as well, as that's likely to then result in a prolonged period where growth and activity is, is depressed. Now, looking at the ways in which governments have actually tried to uh, come to a solution to this, it's really been centered on three major pillars. And the first of these is actually the availability of mass low cost testing um, mechanisms. And I would say that in terms of these testing mechanisms, 
they, they don't necessarily need to be as accurate as long as they have a fairly strong sort of predictive power in making sure that isolations can happen in a non-random way. The second of these pillars is actually to focus on efforts to contact and to trace um, infected personnel or individuals. And number three, which, which has been happening along in the sidelines is of course the strengthening of crucial supply chains. And so to a large extent, we've seen most parts of the developed world satisfy, if not um, all three of these criteria, and they'll be in a better position to open up. However, I would still stress that there needs to be a high uh, degree of caution. And I think from both the governments and also individual civilians, they need to be very alert uh, for, for ways to uh, prevent uh, the, 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 the rate of new infection. So then I'd like to talk about um, some developments that we see from a financial market perspective, which is about the oil markets. I think in particular, uh, what's happened uh, on the next slide, uh, if we look at the WTI uh, futures curve, we actually can see for the May contract, uh, or even though it's uh, expired now, that's actually printed at a negative uh, price level. Now, I think there's a combination of, uh, of effects that, that's, that's produced this, but these shocks, again, just highlight the, the, the environment that we're in. And of course, market uh, liquidity uh, is going to be impacted as well, as we, as, as we can see uh, in this chart here. But another impact that we're seeing is the consequence of some further disinflationary pressures in, in the short term. But in terms of the ingredients that has broadly contributed to this uh, result, I would say there are sort of three effects here. In terms of a demand effect, um, generally when we see low commodity prices or low oil prices, that would actually result in a fairly strong quantity effect. But given the state of the world that we're in and also the impact of these lockdowns, the demand reaction function has actually turned to be quite inelastic. And so whilst prices are low, no one can really do anything about it because they're just stuck. Now, in trying to estimate the impact from a demand perspective, we think that around 29 million barrels a day, uh, so the reduction in demand has occurred in the oil market. But that reduction in demand hasn't been met with a change in supply. And in fact, if you look at the chart on the right hand side, oil supply has actually been increasing for a prolonged period. Now, there are marginal producers, uh, both in the US and the, shore, uh, in the shale oil industry, and also to a large extent in the Middle East, that have contributed to the rising output. At the same time, we've seen an unprecedented amount of capex in the US shale industry as well to coincide with this. And so whilst we've had a period of very low prices, the supply response has actually been quite opposite. And so as a result, we've seen active users, um, end users in the oil market, stocking up on a lot of crucial supplies. And so what that's resulted in is of course these near-term dislocations in the futures market, where a combination of a liquidity factor, uh, a supply factor, costs, transportation, and storage constraints have all been uh, brought together to, 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 to sort of result in this dislocation. But in terms of where we should think about long-term prices, I would say that in any market, long-term prices will be dictated by, by marginal costs. And marginal costs are clearly going to be non-negative here. And so a more interesting observation across the oil market is that we're likely to see a very strong structural effect where a combination of uh, reductions in uh, supply is likely to result in a fair degree of market uh, consolidation that will eventually then see prices uh, behave back up to around their long run uh, marginal costs. At the same time, we continue to see some fairly uh, strong uh, sort of innovations 
in uh, the renewables space, especially looking at electric vehicles and the opportunities and threats that's going to present to the industry. In terms of the final point, which is about um, the market, I think what's, what's really important for investors is that you know, we're currently in a period where arguably the economic cycle is being reset. You know, incomes have fallen along with investment in CapEx. And so for long-term investors, I think definitely there needs to be an eye for, for opportunity uh, in this environment. Now here, we can see that in terms of what's being priced in by equity markets, a very sharp uh, increase in the forward PE ratios is somewhat at odds against interest rates that are at uh, near-term lows. And so I think what this means is that for investors, it's going to be a crucial balancing act between trying to invest over that long term. And so it means that in a period where we do see uh, heightened economic and market stress, it is really worth revisiting that long-term strategic uh, asset allocation. But at the same time, it's also useful to think about opportunity that can be generated through an active asset allocation or a dynamic asset allocation process. Now, our, our recent report, uh, which is about to go out, our Q2 DAA outlook, clearly builds a lot of these views uh, in, in hand. In particular, we do see a more favorable environment for growth assets over our forecast horizon, which is a three-year period. But we do see a lot of these uh, opportunities come through in the credit space, uh, both investment grade and in high yield. Across equities, we have seen an improvement in valuation outcomes. But as, of, as, but as I have alluded to earlier, that uh, we definitely are not in, or we don't see a, a rush or a need to enter that market quite quickly as we're still working through uh, the, the economic shock. But this is going to be a key balancing act that investors will also need to pay attention to in this environment. So I'll hand that back to you, Kylie, um, and happy to take any questions at the end. Thanks, Yaying. So now we'll go over to Harry, who's going to take a bit of that long-term perspective and uh, talk about the strategic research and capital market assumptions side of things. Over to you, Harry. Uh, thanks, Kylie. Um, well, uh, Yaying has focused more on the uh, short-term economic environment. Uh, my first section is about the big picture. And um, it is normal during times of stress for long-term investors to focus on daily index movements. Now, I had not appreciated it at the time, but uh, my book launched last December, Investment Wisdom for the Digital Age, was probably the last time Mercer organized a physical client event for a while. Now, I had hoped to see you at our Global Investment Forum in March, as I did have a session on the digital age prepared. Um, now, even before COVID-19 happened, uh, the book concluded we would see a decade of lower returns, a focus on risk management, increased regulation, disruption, and uh, disintermediation. So COVID-19 has basically brought these trends forward. The other piece of a uh, big picture strategic research we produced this year was our teams for 2020. So the first team was, um, how long have you got? Suggesting that um, investors should benchmark and align themselves with their perspective uh, long-term time horizon while taking advantage of short-term opportunities. Now, the second theme we identified was uh, business as unusual, and it can now be redefined to include social distancing, supply chain disruption, and deglobalization, uh, quickly becoming the new normal. We also anticipated a battle between shareholders and stakeholders, and it actually started much earlier than we anticipated. So within countries, the question about how do we grow the economy and companies while we maintain our social fabric with increasing unemployment. And also the same thing with, you know, across countries, with stakeholders. How do we deal with shifts in global power, with China increasingly becoming part of our problem and also our solution? So, as I said at last year's forum, China will be the world's largest economy by 2030. Now, the third theme that we identified for this year was the uh, 
positioning for climate change. So Helga will talk a bit more about ESG later. But I just want to say that while the bushfires were a tragic event for our community, it also led to much reduced travel into Australia during the crucial initial stages when COVID-19 expanded so that we could prepare and learn from other countries. So I'm always an optimist and I do believe, you know, we will come out of this again as lucky country. So yes, uh, winter is coming, but uh, Australia and New Zealand have some natural advantages in my opinion. So first, uh, we are far away from the rest of the world. Second, we have a very solid fiscal position. So triple A rating for Australia and double A for New Zealand. And third, our largest trading partner is China with 30% of exports for both countries. And China will be among the first countries to recover. Um, next slide, please, Kylie. Oh, hello, Kylie. Yes, thanks. Um, so I was just going to say um, that we have delivered a lot of research during this crisis to bring forth our point of view in terms of both public and private markets, rebalancing and opportunities. Um, next slide, please. So um, in the digital age, there are four ways that you can access our research. So first, uh, you can subscribe to our newsletters and our research can also be found on our website, shown here. And uh, second, you can also uh, go to our webinars. So again, you get access to our local and global investment experts. As Kylie mentioned, uh, we will host a global webinar next week. Uh, we're a global head of investment research to ensure that you get the best of our global thinking. Um, third, uh, for those of you who subscribe to Mercer Insight, you will find our papers on the uh, strategic research database. And fourth, but not least, uh, in 2020, Mercer started the Strategic Research Community Initiative. So this basically features our research, but also papers from the many managers that uh, we deal with. Uh, so you can contact John Humphreys if you're interested in that. Um, next slide, please. So let's now get to the meat of the presentation, which is our capital market assumptions and how they fit into the big picture. Now, now investing at, at its heart is about capturing risk premia like uh, the equity risk premium. So therefore, we make assumptions about how the world is expected to behave. And models can then be used to test financial objectives. So for example, the chart on the right examines some of the typical risks we look at for clients based on our assumptions, like the probability of meeting your CPI or funding level objective, volatility, the frequency and severity of negative returns, concentration risk, and also illiquidity risk. So these are all very relevant under COVID-19, but what it means in short is that to make informed investment decisions, we need to have a model of the world. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, uh, one slide back. Yes, so um, Mercer actually has two approaches to modeling uh, the world under COVID-19. And uh, as most of you know, the main model we use is the capital market simulator, which is known as a stochastic model, in that it operates uh, using a, a distribution projections of GDP, inflation, interest rates, and so on. So we run like 2000 alternative future paths to history, and then generate specific portfolio returns, as can be seen uh, on the chart uh, in the top right hand corner. Now, it is probably fair to say that all models out there are being tested to the limits by COVID-19. Uh, but you will probably agree that models must have certain attributes to remain relevant in this environment. So the first one is it, it should allow for regime switching. So I think COVID-19 uh, demonstrated how quickly markets can shift regimes from being rational and optimistic one day to irrational and pessimistic the next day. And the second is that uh, any projections must include the ability for non-normality or extreme left outliers as we recently experienced. And the third is that any model should be able to cater for a lower for longer interest rate environment as we are now reaching the limits of monetary policy. And the fourth is that any model should allow for negative interest rates. And as you know, a large part of the world's global bond marks already trade at negative yields. So what does this mean for our return assumptions? It means that for cash and fixed income, 
we project the RBA to leave rates unchanged for at least the next three years, consistent with our lower for longer framework. After that, we foresee interest rates to slowly mean revert to our neutral rate. However, this does mean that the returns to fixed income instruments are expected to remain between half a percent to one and a half percent for the coming decade. For global equities, prior to COVID-19, they were considered overvalued, especially the US. Now, PEs have since come down, but so have GDP and implicitly earnings growth projections. So net-net, this more than offsets. In general, this means that we are expecting returns for equities between 55 to 6.5% in local currency terms for the coming decade. Now, in terms of the currency, because of the movements in the Australian dollar over the quarter, the forward expected returns to unhedged overseas assets have actually reduced as the Aussie dollar is now slightly undervalued and no longer a source of value add. On the other hand, the Federal Reserve cut interest rates more than the Reserve Bank of Australia, and which means that on an MSCI basket weighted basis, the hedge pickup actually turned slightly positive for the first time in a long time. So what this means for investors is that whereas in the past, the decision to remain unhedged was quite clear, the decision to do so going forward is much more evenly balanced based on our four projections. Now, the second method that we apply to model the world is what we call deterministic scenarios. So we basically use a panel of best estimates from our economists. And the reason we do this is because it balances model risk. So we have a set of 11 global scenarios as shown in the bottom right hand corner. And one could see them as specific paths in our simulation outcomes. So each quarter, we map potential events to the set of scenarios. So most clients are probably aware that in our December scenarios, we did have a potential COVID-19 outbreak as an event. So at the time, our risk factor model projected an equity correction of about 15 to 25%, depending on the severity of the event. Now this correction has since happened. So COVID-19 is no longer a separate event, but part of our base case scenario. So that's a big blue bubble, which basically calls for a U-shaped recovery and a moderate appreciation in equities. Other potential events that we include are a V-shaped recovery, if there is a medical or technological breakthrough within the rally in equities, or a W-shaped recovery, if there is a pandemic resurgence leading to a correction in equity markets, or an L-shaped outcome, for example, if policy failure leads to a lost decade or Japanification. Now, these scenarios form part of our standard stress test so that you can see the impact on your specific portfolios. Um, next slide, please, Kylie. So just for the final slide, uh, just going back on the big picture. So this chart represents a hypothetical balance fund with 30% Australian shares, 30% overseas shares, 40% in fixed. Oh. oh, can you please go on mute? Uh, the blue line is the actual realized the blue line is the actual realized 12-month rolling return of the balance fund. And you can see the, from the blue line, the GFC on the left. Oh, sorry, Kylie, can you move back one slide? Yes, uh, you can see the GFC on the left and the impact of COVID-19 uh, as part of the big picture. So basically what you can see here is that COVID-19 refers to last year's gains. So typically most clients, they use a five or 10 year time horizon when they set SAAs, as valuations take a while to come through, so in the short term noise, in terms of sentiment and momentum dominate. But therefore what I've put in the chart is the green line, which represents the 10 year rolling return of the same balance fund. So as you can see, it is much less volatile than the blue line. Now the red line represents our 10 year target return as generated from our stochastic model. So over the past decade, our average target return, which was the red line, was about 7.2% per annum. The average of the actual 10-year rolling returns, as represented by the green line, was about 7%. So this is a good outcome in the sense that clients actually observed in their portfolios uh, returns closer to our projections. And I've had some clients come back to me with that, which is pretty good. However, uh, the bad news is that our forward-looking returns for this same balance fund for the next decade 
are closer to four and a half percent. And um, this is quite logical. If 40% uh, of your portfolio will now only generate half to one and a half percent. So uh, will our projections be right again? Uh, we don't know. We will know by 2030 um, as they are 10 year projections. Um, I did start and I will end my session on the same note. Um, investors should focus on the long term, but they should also anticipate lower returns and uh, focus on risk management. So I will now hand over to Helga for the responsible investment section. Thanks, Harry. We've seen that COVID 19's elevated what a systemic shock experience is like for us as businesses, investors economies and governments. And what it does is it really tests how well prepared we are and how well positioned we are as investors for looking at the whole picture. And it raises so many questions, questions responsible investors ask themselves about the risks and opportunities associated with whole of economy and societal change or dynamics. Our research this year with the World Economic Forum on transformational investing and governance for managing systemic risks couldn't be better if sadly timed. It drew on the global risks report that WEF produces annually, which you see in the chart here on the screen, where environmental risks feature followed by social risks. For the last decade, we've researched and undertaken modelling into system risks and developed climate change scenario and stress testing of portfolios with analysis supported by environmental, social and governance issues for investors. So what we learn from the virus is that it's a humbling reminder that the world remains at the mercy of the Earth's systems. As investors with a systems approach, we recognise that COVID-19 is not a standalone risk, but is linked to other system risks and that their combination compounds and can magnify its negative effects. Next slide, please, Kylie. However, like Harry, I am an optimist as well. And the silver lining is that the effects of this disruption should accelerate the analysis potential future system shocks and it allows us to look at the way in which differentiating companies build resilience across their entire value chain and those that do not. So using our experience as investors with environmental, social and governance analysis, we've really been able to deploy our studies into resilience that we've been doing for some time. And it's clear that the value of ESG analysis is becoming increasingly more powerful. And we can see here, if we want to begin with, let's look at the short term to see how ESG performed during COVID-19. There's no better short term evidence of this value than the sector neutral MSCI ACQUI ESG Leaders Index, the, top, the chart top left, for example, which outperformed the broad ACQUI index especially through the most recent market downturn in February and March of 2020. On the right bottom hand chart, the one with the dark blue bars, the largest factor contribution was pure ESG, followed as you can see by quality, volatility and momentum, according to MSCI. Morningstar found that for the first quarter of 2020, out of the 26 ESG index funds, um, the firm tracks, and that's US Global Emerging Markets, 24 outperformed. Of 206 sustainable equity and ETF funds in the US, 44% ranked in the top quartile, 70% in the top two, and only 11% in the lowest quartile. And that's performance, net of expenses. The bottom left-hand chart shows a similar pattern emerged if we look back to the 2008 financial crisis, with the MSCI ESG Leaders Index outperforming through the earliest phase. And you can see that in the light blue vertical bars. Given a large spike in volatility this past month, we can see that it's similar to levels seen during the 2008 crisis, which is shown in the dark blue lines. It will be interesting to see if similar ESG performance patterns emerge. What we're seeing though, is that highly rated ESG firms are more likely to be in technology 
healthcare and consumer non-durable sectors um, and are better, more likely to be doing better in the current market environment and through the COVID-19 economic downturn. However, we do have to recognise that this pattern um, could lead to possible underperformance as markets rebound and cyclicals and energy potentially become more favourable. But if we turn now to long-term performance, there is much more, as Harry was saying, to, the, to uh, performance, and in this case, ESG performance, than just downside protection through short-term market shocks. Since its inception in September 2007 to 2020, the MSCI Acquies Leaders Index has returned 5.24%, compared to 4.48% for the broad market and has outperformed the one, three, five and 10 year timeframes as well. A comprehensive examination of hundreds of published reports and academic studies over the past seven decades, looking at long-term ESG investment performance shows a positive correlation between ESG factors and company financial performance more than 90% of these showed a neutral or positive connection be between ESG and corporate financial performance. And this is also um, supported by recent Harvard research findings, focusing on the materiality of ESG factors to support this case. Kylie, please uh, turn to the next slide. So if we think, what are some of the learnings that we're having from the COVID 19 virus as response from investors. We're seeing a rise in social issues and the social lens that ESG brings. George Sarafane et al. just published a corporate resilience and response study where they found evidence that companies with labour and supply chain practices that were seen as protecting employees and taking action to secure their supply chain experienced higher institutional monetary flows and less negative re uh, returns. So it was more about their practice than the way in which they responded to the crisis and what they said. And it had, that had a less significant impact on investor behavior and their stock market performance. So responsible investing is about delivering financial performance through a long-term stakeholder-centric approach to give us that deeper understanding of the risk and opportunities of its business. And we do know, looking both at these short-term and, of course, longer-term uh, patterns, that the interconnectedness of S and G of the, in the risk landscape, whether it be driven by a health pandemic like we're currently experiencing, climate change or geostrategic tensions, calls on us to apply all of our analysis and learnings that we've been developing for well over a decade. All investors want to have functional economies and societies, which means short term, we need to protect labour and longer term, fiscal stimulus should focus on environmental and social measures as the foundation of a more sustainable, resilient and equitable society and system. Thank you, Kylie. Great, Helga, that's uh, really fantastic. So we will turn to the, uh, the Q&A section now. We've got a couple of minutes there and I, I do see that we've got uh, quite a few questions. So uh, we'll see how we go getting through them. If we don't uh, manage to respond to all of them, we'll, we'll get them out to you um, after the webinar. Um, Helga, I might just stay with you for a moment because there is a question here um, really about looking at the, uh, pulling together, I guess, two concepts that we've touched on today. One is around the foil, fall in the oil price, cheap oil, and what that might mean for um, alternative energy companies. Do you mind picking that one up? Yes, so um, the fall in the oil price is obviously affecting um, renewables as well as oil. Um, but what we do see is that um, there has been a uh, you know, phenomenal impact on all forms of energy. Um, so it will affect 
the outlook in terms of um, economic outlook on renewables as well as oil. But um, Harry, would you like to add some comment there? Uh, yeah, so, so I, I do agree with Helga that look, I mean, I think it raises the bar for renewable companies as well in terms of the, you know, producing at the marginal costs. So everybody suffers in this, uh, in this environment, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Harry, I might stick with you while you're there. So um, question here for you asking, are you making a distinction between the return expectation for credit versus sovereign traditional fixed income, um, observing that credit has tended to lead equities in the recovery phase of post uh, past crises? That's right. So basically when we forecast returns, um, we do make a distinction between, well, actually we have a lot of different asset classes including uh, uh, government bonds, credit, high yield, emerging market debt, leverage loans, and so on. So I think we differentiate between about 20 different fixed income assets. So you can take your pick. But yes, in general, you're right. Credit uh, will do well. And in addition, in this environment, as you know, for the first time, the Federal Reserve has actually said they will backstop credit in addition to government bonds in terms of the quantitative easing program. So I'm, I'm actually, uh, I think I wrote a paper saying that um, you know, go about fixed income investing smart and don't just invest in a, you know, set and forget the passive bond index. Okay, uh, there's a question here. I might, I might take it myself. So it's asking about whether there's comments regarding illiquid assets and the impact of the 20,000 withdrawals uh, from super that have been allowed by the government as part of the, the early release support package. Um, look, I think it is a consideration for super funds, um, making sure that they've got the ability to hold their illiquid assets through these types of periods where you're likely to see, um, you know, obviously your, your, your listed assets get drawn down in value. So that does tend to push up your weight of illiquids. And at the same time, where you're likely to see greater levels of um, movement around. So that could either take the form of members switching out of growth assets into cash um, and indeed specifically to this crisis, um, members having the ability to, to access their super early. Um, you know, I would suggest that for most funds, they should be really pretty well placed to manage through this environment whilst, you know, being able to meet those liquidity needs and hold those illiquid assets through. Um, and I think most funds get to that position because we do do quite extensive liquidity stress testing that consider these very types of environments and whether you can, um, you know, whether you've got the appetite for illiquidity, illiquidity that's strong enough um, to be able to hold through periods such as this. And so I think most funds out there will be pretty well placed. I know everyone's been pretty busily planning for the early release payments, which have started to flow this week. Um, in this particular instance, because uh, some of the financial hardship is so confined or concentrated in certain sectors. It is perhaps some of those very sector specific or industry specific industry funds that, that might be experiencing a level of redemptions that perhaps they didn't anticipate within their liquidity stress test. And, and that might be where there's, there's greater levels of pain. But I, I think for the most part, across most super funds, uh, they'll be pretty well placed. Um, okay, so I might come back. Uh, yeah, Ying, I wonder if you could have a go um, at this one, and then I know we are hitting up against uh, time, so we might make it the last question. So it's saying, do we think that the present crisis will have a longer term effect um, on oil pr prices with people working from home more, perhaps traveling less, both domestic and overseas, um, and, and maybe with less disposable income? Do you want to have a go at answering that one? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of what we're seeing uh, with the lower oil prices is that compared to the 1970s, the overall economic sort of uh, growth dependence on oil is actually much less now than what it was uh, in, in the past. And, and I would say that it certainly has been a number of trends, uh, especially towards the, the alternatives uh, that suggest sort of a lower level of oil uh, intensity going going into the future as well, especially you know if we think about you know the rise of of electric vehicles. But to a large extent, uh, some of these 
changes certainly do sit on sort of the sovereign level or the government level in terms of uh, in, in terms of trying to encourage uh, some of these uh, shifts and also just in terms of the prices I mean these negative prices that we're seeing they're going to be uh, a short-term uh, sort of consequence of, of, of markets just based on uh, the, the, the factors discussed and over a longer term period given that marginal costs are still going to be non-negative it's difficult to envisage a period where, where, where negative oil prices are likely to, to remain in the system there. Okay, thanks, Yaying. Um, I am conscious that ha there has been a couple of questions here that we haven't gotten to, and because this is our last webinar, I think we'll take a look at those and see if we can include some responses in the material that goes out um, with the, the replays. Someone did ask about whether slides are made available, and yes, they are. Um, otherwise, we'll leave you to it. Look out for the invitation for the global webinar that's on next week and for the uh, survey seeking your feedback and otherwise uh, please stay safe and look after yourself. Thanks very much everyone. Goodbye.